Now, oh. hello and welcome to this exploring session. Today we are looking at the uh, first two acts of The Tragedy of Antony uh, by Robert Garnier, uh, done into English by the Countess of Pembroke, Mary Herbert Sidney, uh, printed in, uh, in 1592 and then later again in 1595. Its first printing was uh, simply as Antonius, a tragedy, and then it gets uh, re retitled The Tragedy of Antony uh, for 1595. Probably written uh, uh, Mary Sidney's translation of it uh, written uh, around about 1590 so a few uh, years before that um, and it is a play that we have looked at before on the podcast uh, we have done some rough very very rough uh, more part of rehearsal preparation uh, exploring sessions on this play because we have created a full cast audio adaptation I say we've created it we've recorded it Unfortunately, then this this whole plague thing happened, and it's currently languishing in the edit, and I haven't actually finished uh, putting it together yet. Um, so this is a play I know very very well, and w the pr the disadvantage of this process of us trying to come at it fresh and find out new things is if somebody's sitting in the corner knowing all the answers, that's really boring and tedious. So I'm going to disappear in just a moment and hand you over to Sarah, uh, who is going to be guiding us uh, through this uh, play over the next two sessions. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm going to get out of the way. Um, but uh, yes, there is a lot of material available already on this on the podcast. There is more material to come. There will be links in the show notes for those at home who want to be watching that and uh, and finding out about that. The only thing I'll say to the room before we start is I think it's a very obvious co comment to make. This play features some long speeches. Uh, you don't need to ever mention that again. I think th that that's it. You, we know there are long speeches. That's cool. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to disappear, do some behind the scenes text work and leave you all in the delightful hands of Sarah Blake. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, Rob knows all about this play. I know nothing at all. I have quickly skimmed through the first couple of acts, but that's it. So um <laughs> Good luck, everybody. Uh, reading these long speeches with me today uh, is a team of crack readers who it's my pleasure to introduce. So reading Charmian is, is muted. Charmian is oh, muted. Anne, I'm muted. Honestly, you would have thought by now I would have learned this. I think it's been using it since March. Hi, I'm Eleanor. I'm a um, actor and producer and singer based in Suffolk and just muddling through medieval English as best I can. And reading Cleopatra is... Hi, I'm Tamara and um, yes, I am an actor as well. I produce, I'm stuck in Germany. It's not looking so bad even though we're already in lockdown. And um, this is my weak attempt at Cleopatra. Very nice too. Reading Philostratus is... Hi, I'm Eric and I will try not to philosophize too much. Very nice. Reading Chorus 1 and Diomeda is... I'm Lois, a retired and tired academic living in London. <laughs> Reading Anthony is... Hi, I'm Alan Scott, based in Suffolk, but I'm neither an actor nor an academic. Reading the second chorus is... Hello, I'm Dan. I'm an actor based in Montpellier, France. I'm also very punchy from being up all night. Um, I should just in the United States. Yeah, I should just say we're recording this uh, the day after the US election, so this is why no one's had any sleep. Uh, <laughs> reading uh, Eras and Chorus 3 is... Hello, I'm Helen Good. I'm in Yorkshire and I'm a historian. And I'm very tired. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've had no sleep either, but I'm bright eyed and bushy tailed and I will be reading the stage directions. Uh, so this play opens up with a whole load of stuff having just happened off stage, uh, namely the Battle of Actium, which it's fair to say has not gone well for Antony and Cleopatra. So all of that's just taken place and we get straight into act one with Enter Antony Alone. Since cruel heavens against me obstinate, since all mishaps of the round engine do conspire my harm, since men, 
since powers divine, air, earth, and sea are all injurious, and that my queen herself, in whom I lived, the idol of my heart, doth me pursue, its meat I die. For her I have forgone my country, Caesar unto war provoked, for just revenge of sister's wrong, my wife who moved my queen, army to jealousy, for love of her, in her allurements court, abandoned life, I honour have despised, disdained my friends, and, the, and of the stately Rome, despoiled the empire of her best attire, condemned the power that made me so much feared, a slave become unto her feeble face. O cruel traitress, woman most unkind, thou dost forsworn my love and life betray, and gives me up to a rageful enemy, which soon, O fool, will plague thy perjury. Yielded Pelissium on this country's shore, yielded thou hast my ships and men of war, that naught remains, so destitute am I, but these same arms which on my back I wear. Thou shouldst have had them too, and me unarmed, yielded to Caesar, naked of defence, which while I bear, let Caesar never think, triumph of me shall his proud chariot grace. Not think with me his glory to adorn, on me alive to use his victory. Thou only, Cleopatra, triumph hast. Thou only hast my freedom servile made. Thou only hast me vanquished, not by force, for forced I cannot be, but by sweet baits of thy eyes graces, which did gain so fast upon my liberty that naught remained, none else henceforth, but thou, my dearest queen, shall glory in commanding Antony. Have Caesar fortune and the gods his friends, to him have Jove and fatal sisters given the scepter of the earth. He never shall subject my life to his obedience. But when that death, my glad refuge, shall have bounded the course of my unsteadfast life, and frozen corpse under a marble cold, within tombs, bosom, widow of my soul. Then at his will, let him its subject make. Then what he will, let Caesar do with me. Make me limb after limb be rent. Make me my burial take in sides of Thracian wool. Poor Antony, alas, what was the day the days of loss that gained thee thy love. Wretch Antony, since then Megira pale, with snaky hairs enchanted in thy misery. The fire thee burnt was never Cupid's fire, for Cupid bears not such a mortal brand. It was some fury's torch, Orestes torch, which sometime burned his mother murdering soul. When wandering mad, rage boiling in his blood, he fled his fault which followed as he led. Kindled within his bones by shadow pale, of mother slain returned from Stygian lake. Antony, poor Antony, since that day, thy old good hap did far from thee retire, thy virtue dead, thy glory made alive, so oft by martial deeds is gone in smoke. Since then the bays so well thy forehead knew, to Venus myrtles yielded have their place, triumphs to pipes, field tents to courtly bowers, lances and pikes to dances and to feasts. Since then, O wretch, instead of bloody wars, thou shouldst have made upon the Parthian kings for Roman honour filled by Crassus' fall. Thou thrust the curious off and fearful helm with coward courage unto its Egypt's queen in haste to run about her neck to hang, languishing in her arms, thy idol make. In sum, given up to Cleopatra's eyes, thou breakest at length from the hence, as one enchalmed breaks from the enchanter that him strongly held. For thy first reason, spoiling of their force the poison cups of thy fair sorceress, recurred thy sprite, and then on every side thou madest against the earth with soldiers swarm. All Asia hid, Euphrates banks do tremble, to see at once so many Romans there, breathe horror, rage, and with a threatening eye, in mighty squadrons, cross the swelling streams. 
naught seen but horse, and fiery sparkling arms, naught heard but hideous noise of muttering troops. The path, the mead, abandoning their goods, hide them for fear in hills of Hercule, or redoubting thee, then willing to besiege the great freight head of Media, thou campest to their walls with vain assault, thy engines fit, mishap, not thither brought. So long thou stayest, so long thou dost rest, so long thy love with such things nourished, reframes, reforms itself, and stealingly, or he takes his force and re becomes more great. For of thy king, queen, the looks, the grace, the words, sweetness, allurements, amorous delights, entered again thy soul, then day and night, in watch, in sleep, her image followed thee, not dreaming but of her, repenting still, that thou for war had such a goddess left. Thou canst no more for path, nor Parthian bow, sallies, assaults, encounters, shocks, alarms, but ditches, rampiers, wards, entrenched grounds. Thy only care is sight of Nihilus' streams, sight of that face whose guileful semblance doth, wandering in thee, infect thy tainted heart. Her absence thee besots, each hour, each hour of stay. To thee impatient seems an age, enough of conquest. Praise thou deemst enough, if soon enough the bristled fields thou see, a fruitful Egypt and the stranger flood, thy queen's fair eyes and other pharos lights. Return, lo, dishonoured, despised in wanton love. A woman thee misleads, sunk in foul sink. Meanwhile, respecting naught, thy wife Octavia and her tender babes, of whom the long contempt against thee wets, the sword of Caesar now thy lord become. Lost thy great empire, all those goodly towns reverence thy names as rebels now thee leave, rise against thee, and to the ensign's flock of conquering Caesar, who in walls thee round, Caged in thy hold, scarce master of thyself, late master of so many nations. Yet, yet, which is of grief, extremest grief, which is yet a mischief, highest mischief, is Cleopatra. Alas! Alas, it's she, it's she augments the torment of thy pain, betrays thy love, thy life, alas, betrays. Seizes her please, whose grace she speaks, seeks to gain with thought her crown to save and fortune make. Only thy foe with common ought have been. Of her, if her I always loved, and the first flame of a heart-killing love shall burn me last, justly complain I she disloyal is, nor constant is, even as I constant am, to comfort my mishap, despising me no more, then when the heavens favoured me. But ah, by nature women wavering are, each moment changing and rechanging minds, unwise, who blind in them, thinks loyally, ever to find in beauty's company. Anthony, poor Anthony. <laughs> so deliquizing at length there and uh, yeah, bemoaning his not and bl blaming Cleopatra for it. Helen, I think you had something to say about that, did you? Well, I, I, there is a tendency in many of these plays to blame the woman. Um, the woman tempted me and I did fall. It, it's been a common, uh, 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 common subject of, of, of story and fable. What is he actually blaming her for here? Existing as far as I can <laughs> tell. <laughs> But more, more specifically, what's happened? What's going on? Well, he's lost the battle, and it's all her fault. Why? If Why? it hadn't been for her, he would have been manly and soldierly and determined. Right. Okay. So and he's a good chap. <laughs> of course, of course he would. So he's basically. Um, was he actually winning this battle though before? Before she, 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 before he ch he chased after her, was was he actually? I mean, sorry, I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Any anybody is like I haven't a clue. 
to be honest. I, d I don't think he stood a hope in hell because he was fighting the Roman main machine. Yeah, yeah. So, it, yeah, right, OK. So it might not necessarily be Cleopatra's fault, but we don't know. We've only had Antony's uh, viewpoint of it here. Yes, but, I mean, he shouldn't have been fighting at sea anyway. I, the, the theory is that was her idea too. Ah, right, OK. Well, that's already happened. Um, Alan, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did you find it? Um, tricky. Tricky. The punctuation is um, interesting, partial, and in cases, in some places, totally misleading. <laughs> um, and I hadn't actually pre read it, so I was actually seeing it almost a sentence at a time. Um, so I made a rob from my own back, but that's the rules by which we work on these first looks. Um, you know, and I'm still not quite sure what, what he was doing other than a woe is me at great, great length. <laughs> well, also, because it's written in um, iambic pentameter, isn't it? I think, yeah. Um, it does have that quality of just kind of um, lulling you through it a bit, mm. doesn't it? Um, some nice lines, though, for... For of thy queen, the looks, the grace, the words, sweetness, allurements, amorous delights, entered again thy soul, and day and night, in watch and sleep, her image followed thee. So we do have the sense that this is a man who is very much in love, mm. but repenting it. Helen. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we have to take into account that it's a translation from the French, and French tragedies tend to be very heavy on words and mm. very low on action. Mm. Yeah. Um, in my experience of them, which I, I will admit is limited to A-level. Well, it's, it's, still, it's still more experience than I have, really. So <laughs> that's fine. Anyone else got anything to add at this point? Or shall we... Eric, sorry, I didn't see you there. I was going to say that historically, like, Cleopatra was a really good strategist, as far as I know. Uh, but I don't know anything about Antony. I just know about her. <laughs> she is, like, sort of... But he, I, I don't think he can blame her. I mean, he's just fighting Caesar, which is probably, like, what chance in, you know... What, what are the odds that he's going to beat Caesar in his own game? Yeah. But it's yeah. not that Caesar. No, it's not Julius, is it? Yeah, true. It's Octavian, I mean, isn't it? It's Octavian. Sort of but he inherited even... the sort of strategy. Fun fact, strategy they were allies. Him. Even so, though, the fact that, um, you know, if you're losing a battle and, like, all your ships are about to be sunk and your men um, drowned or captured or killed, it's probably quite a good idea to retreat at that point, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, Lois. Well, the, I think part of the point of that speech, like the openings of uh, a lot of classical tragedies, is to give us the whole backstory. Mm. And, uh, and he does make various points. I mean, it's, you know, it's a bit hard to follow, but that uh, that he made Caesar his enemy uh, by his treatment of Caesar's sister because he loved Cleopatra. I mean, his love of Cleopatra just keeps making him do dumb things and uh, make things worse and worse for himself. Mm. Yeah. Right, well, we have had Antony's take on what's happened. Anyone got anything else to add? In which case we will move on and get another perspective on the um, events that have taken place. So enter the chorus. The boiling tempest still makes not sea waters foam, nor still the northern blast disquiets quiet streams nor who his chest to fill sails to the morning beams on waves wind tosseth fast still keeps his ship from home nor jove still down doth cast inflamed with bloody ire on man on tree on hill his darts of thundering fire nor still the heat doth last on face of parched plain nor wrinkled cold doth still on frozen furrows rain. But still, as long as we in this slow world remain, mishaps our daily mates our lives do entertain. 
and woes which bear no dates still perch upon our heads none go but straight will be some greater in their steads nature made us not free when first she made us live when we began to be to be began our woe which growing evermore as dying life doth grow do more and more us grieve and tire us more and more no stay in fading states for more to height they reach their fellow miseries the more to height do stretch they cling even to the crown and threatening furious wise from tyrannizing pates you often pull it down in vain on waves untried to shun them go we should to scythes and massagetes who near the pole reside in vain to boiling sands which phoebus battery beats for with us still they would cut seas and compass lands the darkness no more sure to join with heavy night the light which gilds the days to follow titan pure no more the shadow light the body to ensue than wretchedness always us wretches to pursue oh blessed who never breathed or whom with pity moved death from his cradle reaved and swaddled in his grave and blessed also he as curse may blessing have who low and living free no prince's charge hath proved by stealing sacred fire prometheus then unwise provoking gods to ire the heap of ills did stir and sickness pale and cold our end which onward spur to plague our hands too bold to filch the wealth of skies in heaven's hate since then of ill with ill enchained we race of mortal men full fraught our breasts have borne and thousand thousand woes our heavenly souls now thorn which free before from those no earthly passion pained war and war's bitter cheer now long time with us stay and fear of hated foe still still increaseth sore our harms worse daily grow less yesterday they were than now and will be more tomorrow than today War and war's bitter cheer. And that was a chorus of Egyptians um, who basically uh, took the theme that Antony um, was talking about in a very personal way in the first scene and sort of opened it out and made it more about the Egyptian um, state and the Egyptian people in general. Um, and what were they saying? I think they were talking about human beings in general. I mean, that life is just awful, you know, <laughs> that uh, it all started with Prometheus stealing fire and making the gods his enemy. And ever since then, it's been going downhill. It's just how I feel. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, yeah. yeah. Starts off bad and just gets worse. Yep. Very yep. nice. So yeah, we sort of move from a, a, a sort of personal um, dilemma of this of this one character and then we see how it affects the whole the whole of well, the whole of the nation but also the whole of humanity yeah um about the pain of the human lot how how would you if you are actually going to do a production of this how would you stage this chorus do you think how would you want to perform it mm. Mm. I've always found the chorus a real problem in productions of Greek tragedy. Oh. I mean, so often it's five women sort of doing this and uh, looking really silly. Uh, it's interesting, though, because there is, yeah, there's physicalization, isn't there, Tamara? Well, I was just wondering if you could um, stick them in the audience oh. so that they are sitting next to the audience or in the audience and basically having a chat with the audience. Mm. Um, yeah. 
yeah, good, good idea, Eric. I was going to suggest because like you've got visual stuff like by stealing sacred fire, Prometheus, then and wise, like so on and so forth. You could just like sort of have a uh, not shadow puppetry, but like sort of like something visual going on as well. So mm. you you don't just have speech. Mm. Otherwise, it's kind of well. I mean, the description is great, but you know, it's a bit long. <laughs> Dan, was that half a hand, or what, were you just kind of? I forget my thoughts organized because. Okay, that's yeah. yeah. Because I've seen some really bad um, Racine in French as well mm -hmm. as in English, um, mm -hmm. Berenice or things like that, where I've seen translations where you tr you're trying to adapt that classical style of acting, and you end up having just a bunch of statues on stage who are speaking mm -hmm. and who are lull lulling all of us to sleep. Mm. Especially doesn't work when it's in English, I think, if you can't find the musicality in it. And I think this is the problem with, with what Alan was saying here, because I have no problem. I mean, no, I shouldn't say no surprise, but I, I was comparing the, the punctuation, of course, um, to not only to quarter one, 1592, but then also to the, I don't, I don't have a, uh, an edition of the French version from 1578, the, the original quarto, but I do have the 1605 as well as 1580. And what's striking to me is how much it really does follow, um, not just the punctuation, but also attempts to follow the mise en page, that, it, that would be the indents and the structure and whatnot. These are basically cueing you in. I mean, when you've got the first line that's not indented and the rest indented, mm. it's, it's basically telling you how, you know, in a sense, how you should be structuring your speeches. And if, yeah. you, if you try to do some sort of naturalistic reading of it, and I've been listening now, I refrained from speaking the first time, but now that I'm listening to it again, I'm thinking it's just not going to work. This is not a naturalistic speech. These plays were not structured to be that way. So now I'm thinking that really you need, I'm, I'm thinking maybe simplest is actually best. You just need a really damn good reader to be able to speak to the audience who can find the musicality of it. And in a way almost try not to do all the pyrotechnics and whatnot, because you're going to lose the language if you do. This is just not a play for, um, oh, I got to stage every little thing and do um, pantomiming, you know, and whatnot. That's just mm. my opinion. Mm. Alan. I must admit, one of the things that strikes me as a possible way of doing the, this chorus would be if you've got almost a souk type setting with a crowd, a group of non-speaking Egyptian ordinary people and someone on the then equivalent of the soapbox. Right. And do, do it that way. So, uh, and what would, what, why would you do that? What would, what would that um, bring? Because effectively it's the, it's the voice of the people. It's mm. the Egyptian people who can mm. see that uh, the outcome of this is effectively Egypt is going to cease to exist as a, an independent state. Yeah. I mean, the thing that strikes me about this is that there's a lot of very passionate language um, in this speech. These are people who are really suffering and in a great deal of pain, uh, to pick up on your point, Alan, you know, the, the public are really up against it here. Um, so I think there's probably scope going back to what Dan was saying as well, um, you know, because you've got this very rhythmical uh, musical like Alexandrine structure um it might be quite interesting especially if you did have a chorus of several people so it, it it would then come out as more of a dirge to actually really go for it with the whole you know with the the, the hair pulling and the and the and the writhing and the um you know the the sort of really playing up the pain of it so that we have that contrast between Antony who's being um quite introspective with his grief and then a very public external um, manifestation of it. Uh, Dan, then Alan. I don't know if, I hate to just refer to a production that probably one or nobody saw, um, but I saw Fiona, Fiona Shaw do Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner mm. the Olympic tunnels a few years ago. She it was just basically a monologue, but then she would have just little props here and there, the ship and it was, um, it was a simple reading, but certainly she got into it, but she wasn't trying to act it out, essentially. She was trying to narrate it, in a sense, and show mm. the audience what was happening, but not grand gestures, basically letting the language um, 
carry it. And obviously, Rama the Ancient is a poem. And I think this is rather than trying to play it like a play, I mean, play it for what it is. It's a poem. Mm. Well, it is verse, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Alan. The other thought is um, whether you could actually do it to split that chorus. It is from the chorus, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a single voice. It could, it, you could almost do alternating stanzas between two speakers. Or, or maybe even more, different members or more. of the public. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, um, interesting. You know, to, to actually do it as a crowd scene. Mm. Um, with each one sort of adding a further layer of gloom, doom and despondency. Mm. Coming out and giving their own take on it. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Uh, um, Lois, you look like you're hovering on the brink of saying something. Uh, yeah, I think it would make it less boring. I mean, the thing is, they're not contradicting each other. Um, no. It's not really, an, it's not an argument. It's also not a narrative. I mean, it's simply really saying the same thing again and again. That, uh, um, In fact, I, I did wonder, uh, I don't know if, Dan, you remember what the what is the French word that is translated here by still? Because still is just repeated, and it means always. I think in this case, not uh, not yet. Uh, I can find it really fast here. Where's the, the bus? Well, if it's right at the beginning, and then it just keeps being repeated in virtually every line. You know, oh, the still, still inclusive sore and right and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. I'll find it really fast, but yeah. yeah. Because they just keep saying, you know, the, you know, all these things, horrible things in nature don't go on forever, but misery for human beings does go on forever. I mean, that's the message of the whole thing, as far as I can see. And it comes back to the word still near the Sounds end. Sounds like a toujours to me. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. And with, uh, but two syllables instead of one. Well, it builds up the um, intensity, doesn't it? I mean, it's like waves waves of intensity. I mean, yes, that, that, that there's not much of a journey in terms of the narrative, but there's a, a journey in the, um, the amount of intensity uh, of the emotion. So the, the, the emotion is building and building That's and building. There was some way that the chorus could kind of keep stressing that word. The trouble is it's not a very good word because it doesn't mean exactly what we think it means. Um, it's it's not quite the same here in the in the French version. It'd be um, um, augment et nos cœurs nuit et jour notre malheur toujours en pire. Mais it doesn't have toujours toujours. Oh, it doesn't use toujours as much. Uh, that's yeah. yeah, it does yeah. say toujours earlier. It says toujours depuis la race humaine uh -huh. when it says in heaven's hate since then. But there's that's the only other toujours, and there's not even a. All right, a so it's her idea to keep stressing still, still, still. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that could actually, I mean, that could bring a sort of quite a, a, a compelling dramatic, uh, like intensity to it. I keep using that word intensity, but I, I, I do think there is scope for when this is actually performed to, I mean, everybody would probably want to go off and kill themselves by the end of it, but it would certainly be, um, it would certainly be compelling. I think there's a, there's a lot to get your teeth stuck into. Anyway, I think we should move on because um, we spent quite a bit of time on that. So we now go into Act Two and enter Philostratus. What horrible fury, what cruel rage, O oh, Egypt, so e extremely thee torments. Hast thou the gods so angered by thy fault? Hast thou against them such some such crime conceived that their ingrained hand lift up in threats they should desire in thy heart the blood to bathe, and that their burning wrath which naught can quench should, should pitiless on us still lighten down. We are not hewn out of the monstrous mass of giants those which heaven's rack conspired. Ixion's race, false praetor of his loves, nor yet of him who feigned lightnings found, nor yet Tantalus, nor bloody Atreus, whose cursed banquet for Thiestes' plague made the beholding son for horror turn his back and backward from his course return and hastening his wing-footed horse's race plunge him in sea for shame to hide his face while sudden night upon the wandering world from midday's light her starry mantle cast but what we be whatever wickedness by us is done alas with what more plagues what more eager torments could the gods declare to heaven and earth that, that the us they hateful hold. With soldiers, strangers, horrible in arms, our hand is hid. 
Our people drowned in tears, but terror here and horror, nought is seen, and present death prizing our life each hour. Hard at our ports and at our porches waits our conquering foe. Hearts fail us, hopes are dead. Our queen laments, and this great emperor sometime would now they did, whom worlds did fear, abandoned, betrayed, are now minds no more, but from his evils by hastened death to pass. Come, you poor people, tired with ceaseless plaints, with tires and with tears and sighs, make mournful sacrifice on Isis altars, not ourselves to save, but soften Caesar and him piteous make to us his prey, that so his lenity may ch change our death into captivity. Strange are the evils the fates on us have brought. Oh, but alas, how far more strange the cause, love. Love, alas, whoever would have thought hath lost, lost this realm, inflamed with this fire. Love, playing love, which men say kindles not, but in soft hearts, hath ashes made our towns, and his sweet shafts with the, whose shot none are killed, which also not with deaths our lands are filled. Such was the bloody, murdering, hellish love, possessed thy heart, fair, false guest, Priam's son firing a brand which after made to burn the Trojan towers by Gratians ruinate. By this love, Priam, Hector, Troilus, Memnon, Dephobus, Glaucus, thousands more, whom red Scamander's armor clogged streams rolled into seas before their dates are dead. So plague he, so many tempests raiseth, raiseth. so murdering he, so many cities raiseth, when insolent, blind, lawless order with mad delight our sense he entertains. All-knowing gods our racks did us foretell by signs in earth, by signs in starry spheres which should have moved us had not destiny with too strong hand warped our misery. The comets flaming through the scattered clouds with fiery beams, most like unbroided hairs, the fearful dragon whistling at the banks and holy apis Ceaseless, ceaseless bellowing as never erst, and shedding endless tears. Blood raining down from heaven in unknown showers, our gods' dark faces overcast with woe, and met dead men's ghosts appearing in the night. Yea, even this night, while all the city stood, oppressed with terror, horror, so servile fear, deep silence over all. The sounds were heard of diverse songs and diverse instruments within the void of air and howling noise such as mad Bacchus priests in Bacchus feasts on Nisa make. And seemed the company, our city lost, went to the enemy. So we forsaken both of gods and men, so are we in the mercy of our foes. And so we, obedient, henceforth obedient, must become to laws of them who have us overcome. Wow, very good. Well done, Eric. <laughs> so there's an interesting, yeah, <laughs> there's an interesting shape developing here because we started off with uh, Anthony in his private grief and torment. We then opened it up to the chorus and we got a more general philosophy on, on how shitty the lot of man is. And then we have Philostratus bringing it back here um, and making it very specific to the plight of these Egyptians and to this city. Um, and yeah, it's kind of giving the play quite an interesting shape and uh, taking it on a journey. How are people feeling about that journey? Alan? One thing I've noticed, which is more textual than anything else, which is that the principal speeches are these long lines Whereas the chorus is, is the shorter line, mm. which is much more easily understandable, or to me is more understandable, um, because you're getting this much more complex structuring of ideas in the longer lines uh, with the subclauses and so on. Um, so when the people are speaking, when the public is speaking, it's a bit more direct and to the point. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, where, where, whereas Anthony and Philostratus both seem to go around the houses 17 times. Yeah, well, they're more, they're more, well, I'm not saying that they, no, they're not necessarily more emotional, but they're more 
um, nuanced, aren't they, yeah. in, in what they're saying? Lois? Yeah, I think it's partly the word order, which is really sometimes terribly hard to unpick. I mean, uh, you know, even I know when I was reading my bit, just trying to stress the right places to get the, the right subject and verb vaguely related to each other. I mean, this, for example, there was something about our emperor sometime, would now they did, whom worlds did fear. I mean, you know, the, the proper word order would be our emperor whom worlds did fear sometime, would now they did. I wish they did now. I mean, you know, you it, it's terribly hard for anybody to take that in. Uh, I think it's partly... I don't know whether it's the, trying to follow the French word order or trying to do something more like Latin word order. I think, uh, you know, they were so soaked in, in Latin, which does have extremely odd word order. And I, I do remember reading in some pedagogical tract that one trouble with, with students when they've discovered this is that they think it's really fun to put words into the worst possible order, you know, for just for the sake of it. And it seems to me that's what sometimes happens here. Well, it's certainly very dense, but it has a lyricism to it, I think. Dan, you're waving. Yeah, definitely. I, yeah, I, I'm going to agree with you there, Sarah. And I and I want to go along. I'm going to say it's much, much easier to follow in French. I hate to say that. Um, mm. It just makes it sound no, like say it. To say it. But <laughs> the, the fact is, is that in French, it has an A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D rhyme scheme. Mm. Um, if you know the, how the French rhythm is, it's always go to the end of the line and then you're going to rhyme the next one and then you're going to rhyme the next one. But the fact that you're really stressing those rhymes, we kind of you kind of get lulled into the rhythm of it. And mm. I'm, I'm, I'll stress again that these paragraphs have invisible pill crows. Once again, it's the structuring order of it. So there's an indent at the beginning of each one when a new thought is going to begin. This is something that really benefits from playing to the end of each line rather than trying to read it naturalistically, playing to mm. the next punctuation mark, if you will. Um, mm. And the next line, because you really, I feel like, are going to miss the structure of it, especially because not every other line is is rhymed. Here, I think that the I think that um, the Countess of Pembroke did a really good job in doing it somewhat and trying to find the lyricism or the poetry, the alliteration at times and whatnot. But if you try to deviate from the from from the verse structure, it it really does become very difficult to unpack. Mm. Follow there. Mm. So yeah, so on that subject, let's unpack it then slightly. So what's going on here? Um, it's we're, They're talking specifically about the city and, and what's happening, or he is rather. Um, there seems to be something here where he's saying basically, um, well, we're not Greek, at, le at least we're not Greek, um, but the gods hate us anyway, even though we're not Greek, um, <laughs> which, which is kind of, you know, not a great argument, but... Um, and, and then it brings us back into the world of the play and to Caesar's specific invasion. Do we, do we learn anything more? Do we get a sense of, of what's happening in, in this world um, ar around them, around us? Because I mean, it's all been very philosophical, but there's a whole ton of stuff going on with these, mm. uh, with these Romans surrounding. Uh, Lois. Yeah, I think this actually is the best speech we've read so far. I think it's quite beautiful, but... Um, mm. Yes, it does first start out with what, what have we done that the gods hate us? And then he mentions all the horrible people in Greek mythology who did awful things and said, we didn't do any of that. There's also, uh, it's kind of returning to Antony's speech as well, because he, he expands the idea of love, you know, that you don't mm. expect love to be so destructive, but in this case, it has been. And then he goes back to Troy and uh, uh, Paris's action in the rape of Helen and how this destroyed the city, which is obviously a sort of uh, prototype of, what's going to happen to them. And, uh, uh, and he refers to all the, uh, the portents and prophecies, which is at the end, which is quite a dramatic bit, in fact. Uh, mm. Yeah, and love playing love, which men say kindles not, but in soft hearts, hath ashes made our town. So yeah. again, this is all Cleopatra's fault, mm -hmm. apparently. Yeah. Well, that's his fault for loving her too, though. Mm. Yeah, true. Um, Eleanor, was that a, 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 a raising your hands in horror or was it, was it just, or did you want to say that something? That was, a, of course, just blame the of woman. Of course, I yes, blame, blame the woman. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> right. no, I am. <laughs> right, uh, anyone? Um, oh, and I also did love as well, um, by signs in earth, by signs in starry spheres, which should have moved us. It's like, we should have seen this coming, damn it. But yeah. we didn't. Yeah. Oh no. Um, anyone got anything else to say, Alan? 
just a quick question to Dan, basically. You've looked at the French, which would be absolutely meaningless to me because I don't do French or any other language. I barely do English. Is the whole original in verse? Yes. Right. That, rhymed that rhymed. then makes some more sense that if it's in rhymed verse, right. that may explain why we're losing some of the rhythmical elements of it. Absolutely, 100% agree. Also, not only rhyme verse, but A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, rhyming structure. Right. Here, I was going to add that, especially because I know we've been doing end town plays, so you've all seen the brackets um, for the rhymes that signal the rhyme schemes to you. The printer here and the printer, the other one, has done a pretty good job of structuring it so you know where, the, where, each, um, where each new thought's going to begin. But this is one where I would love to be able to see where it's going to rhyme because yeah. it's going to help me out a little more into knowing where, where is my thought going to end and where's my new thought going to begin. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Eric. Yeah, I was going to say that it goes, it's very interesting that, you know, they talk about love, blah, 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 but then like suddenly it goes into uh, ghosts and sort of, well, not zombies, but I mean, that sort of very dark sort of fear and like the deep silence overall. And then the sounds were heard. Uh, obviously, uh, I didn't play like that because I was running out of breath. But um, <laughs> I mean, it's just like they, they, it's this building of contrast as well, like love and war and uh, you know, silence and sound and then all that stuff. And I don't know, it's just an interesting no. Yeah, it kind of builds, doesn't it, to a, a, a crescendo of, of imagery like dead men's ghosts and mad Bacchus priests in Bacchus feasts and, and all of that. It's like, yeah, it's piling it on. Helen? Yeah, I saw a National Theatre production once of, of uh, the Oedipus plays and the totally despairing beginning of them. I mean, even before the audience arrived, I have never seen on the Olivier stage such absolute crushing misery before a word was spoken because God had cursed uh, Thebes. Mm -hmm. The gods had cursed Thebes and boy, it was bad. And I'm getting the same vibe from here. Mm. Um, they are, the whole thing is building up to say, we're doomed. Hmm. We are doomed. Yeah, and no, a... not we're doomed. <laughs> Just we're doomed. <laughs> the, the thing is, uh, I put this in the chat earlier, but there is a there is an energy in in misery. I think I think when we read this on the page, there's a tendency, especially when we've all been up all night. There's a tendency um, to to kind of let it wash over us a bit and and feel a bit drained by it. But actually, if you think about how misery feels, it has an intense energy to it, which you would want your performers to bring out. And I think it is there um, in the in the lines and in the imagery and in the musicality of it. It kind of drives it forward. Um, but it would be down to your cast to 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 bring bring that side of it out. Um, right. Unless anyone has anything desperately urgent to say, I think we'll move on. So Philostratus has exited, and we are back with the chorus. Right. This should probably be sung, but it's not going to. Be. Uh, well, it's it's um, it's Dan's chorus now. I think. Yeah, oh, I this is this is chorus two. So. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to do um, a rap to it or anything. I'm not no, going to just how how however however it moves <laughs> down. <laughs> Lament me, we our mishaps drown we with tears our well, for lamentable haps lamented easy grow, and much less torment bring than when they first did spring. We want that woeful song wherewith wood music's queen doth ease her woes among. Fresh springtime's bush green, on pleasant branch alone, renewing ancient moan. We want that moanful sound that prattling prone makes on fields of Thracian ground or streams of Thracian lakes to empt her breast of pain for it is by her slain. Though Alcyons do still bewailing sex lot, the seas with plainings fill which his dead limbs have got. Not even, not ever other grave than tomb of waves to have. 
And though the burden deaf that most meander loves, so sweetly sighs his breath when death his fury proves, as almost softs his heart and almost blunts his dart. Yet all the plaints of those, nor all their tearful alarms, cannot content our woes, nor serve to wear their arms. In soul which we, poor we, to feel enforced be. Nor they of Phoebus bred in tears can do so well, they for their brother shed, who into Pages fell, rash guide of chariot clear, surveyor of the year. Nor she whom heavenly powers to weeping rock did turn, whose tears distill in showers, and show she yet doth mourn, where with his top to skies, Mount Sipolis doth rise. No weeping drops which flow from bark of wounded tree, that merest shame doth show with ours compared may be, to quench her loving fire, who durst embrace her sire nor all the howlings made on Sybil's sacred hill by eunuchs of her trade who Attis, Attis still, with doubled cries resound, which echo makes rebound. Our plaints no limits stay, nor more than do our woes, both infinitely stray, and neither measure knows. In measure, let them plain, who measured griefs sustain. Hmm, and so we're back with the chorus. And again, we've got that shape coming into effect. It opens up again, it becomes more philosophical and more about the, um, the lot of man. Um, interesting, very, very lyrical. We, we were getting uh, that a lovely rhyme scheme there. Um, I think Mary Sidney did quite a good job uh, with that. What did you think about that, Dan? You were reading it. I would say, because I had looked up the French as well, I mean, I didn't read it all the way through it, but if you saw in the, I, I purposely sent you in the chat that particular page, because you can see how in the structure of it, they had actually indented the third line of each mm. to let you know that that's the, 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 the capstone to each of the, the little parts of it. So here I was wondering at first, is it following that, that scheme? And no, it didn't but you can still sort of follow if you read to the end of the line, oh, it's not over yet, it's not over yet. Mm. And I found it, I didn't find it very difficult to follow it. I mean, partly because of what Alan said, these are shorter verse lines. I can, yeah. I can, I can just it, take my time with it. It's not as dense, is it? It's like the, um, the Philostratus section and the Antony section are both so like dense. It's this great mass of words to kind of reflect a great mass of pain. And, and here it is a bit more accessible um, and, and, a, and a bit more, I keep coming back to that word musical. I do think though, it's almost like with the musical, it's like you could, you know, we talk about beating the breast when we're, uh, when we're kind of sorrowing, when we're grieving. And there is that, there is that sense, I think, certainly with these choruses um, of this, the, the breast beating, like actually happening in the, in the lines. Um, so I want to move on um, quite quickly, but does anyone have anything that they're burning to say about that chorus? No? Right. Oh, Eric does. Well done, Eric. Sorry, sorry. I was just going to say that um, it's interesting because like Philostratus has just informed them that we might die, we might be captives, we might be slaves. We don't know. We have to surrender to the laws of the people who have just conquered us and this is the reaction mm. um i don't know it's just interesting sort of they're i mean like they're miserable before but they're still miserable but even more miserable <laughs> yeah well it's interesting I'm, I'm glad you said that actually because it's it's a different kind of misery isn't it almost because it's it suddenly seems to be a lot more melancholic and it's a it's almost like it's a different type of grief um and, and that opening, um, lament we are mishaps, drown we with tears are woeful, lamentable haps, lamented easy grow. There's almost a sense of that, you know, we need to lament, we need to get together and make this public lamentation because that's the only thing we can do to help ease what's going on. And again, that's a, that's a, a sort of philosophical reflection on, on how humanity handles uh, pain and misery, I think to an extent. So good point there, Eric. 
anyone else? Then we should. Oh, yes, Eleanor. Go. It's just a quick one. Mm. Is, he said this was the reaction for me at the beginning. I was like, oh, this is some of the, like, it's the nicest, almost slightly positive stuff that we've heard <laughs> yeah. in terms of like how it's been written. Obviously, it's like, oh, we're still going to die and we're going to be slaves. But it's like, oh, but it's so beautifully written. Like, they don't seem upset until you get like right towards the end and you're like oh no they're still miserable they still they're, they're they still, still hate like, their lives. yeah they're yeah. still they're still about to slip their wrists yeah less than <laughs> right okay then uh we will move on and folks hang on to your hats because we finally have a bit of dialogue not much but we've got a few uh <laughs> we've got a few exchanges here um with um the Queen of the Nile, quite literally, and her handmaidens. So in a new scene, we have Enter Cleopatra, Eris, Charmian, and later uh, Diomede. Diomeda, probably that should be. But I have thee betrayed, dear Antony. My life, my soul, my son. I had such thought that I have thee betrayed, my lord, my king that I would break my vowed faith to thee. I leave thee, deceive thee, yield thee to the rage of mighty foe. I ever had that heart? Rather sharp lightning lighten on my head. Rather may I to deepest mischief fall. Rather the opened earth devour me. Rather fierce tigers feed them on my flesh. Rather, oh, rather let our Nile ascend to swallow me quick some weeping crocodile. And didst thou then suppose my royal heart had hatched thee to ensnare a faithless love? And changing mind as fortune changed cheer, I would weak thee to win the stronger loose. O oh, wretch, O oh, caitiff, O oh, too cruel hap! And did not I sufficient loss sustain, losing my realm, losing my liberty, my tender offspring and the joyful light of beamy sun and yet yet losing more thee antony my care if i lose not what yet remained thy love alas thy love more dear than sceptre children freedom light so ready i to row in charon's barge shall lose the joy of dying in thy love so the sole comfort of my misery to have one tomb with thee is me bereft. So I in shady plains shall plain alone, not as I hoped, companion of thy moan. Oh, height of grief. Why, with continual cries, your griefful harms do you exasperate? Torment yourself with murdering complaints. Strain your weak breast so oft, so vehemently. Water with tears this fair alabaster. With sorrow sting so many beauties wound. Come of so many kings, want you the heart. Bravely, stoutly, this tempest to resist. My evils are wholly unsupportable. No human force can them withstand but death. To him that strives, naught is impossible. In striving lies no hope of my hope of my mishaps. All things do yield to force of lovely face. My face too lovely caused my wretched case. My face hath so entrapped, so cast us down that for his conquest Caesar may it thank, causing that Antony one army lost, the other wholly did to Caesar yield. For not enduring, so his amorous sprite was with my beauty fired, my shameful flight, soon as he saw from rank wherein he stood, in hottest fight, my galleys making sail. Forgetful of his charge, as if his soul unto his lady's soul had been enchained, he left his men, who so courageously did leave their lives to gain him victory. And careless both of fame and armies lost, my oared galleys followed with his ships, companion of my flight, by this base part blasting his former flourishing renown. Are you therefore cause of his overthrow? 
I am sole cause. I did it, only I. Fear of a woman trouble so his sprite. Fire of his love was by my fear inflamed. And should he then to war have led a queen? Alas, this was not his offence, but mine. Antony, I, me, who else so brave a chief, would not I should have taken seas with him, but would have left me, fearful woman, far from common hazard of the doubtful war, or that I had believed. Now, now of Rome or the great empire at our peck, at our peck should bend, or should obey, the vagabonding Scythes, the feared Germans, back-shooting Parthens, wandering Numidians, Britons far removed, and tawny nations scorched with the sun. But I cared not. So was my soul possessed, to my great harm, with burning jealousy, fearing least in my absence Antony should leave me to retake Octavia. Such was the rigour of your destiny. Such was my error and obstinacy. But since gods would not, could you do with all? Always from gods good haps, not harms do fall. And have they not all powers on men's affairs? They never bow so low as worldly cares, but leave to mortal men to be disposed freely on earth whatever mortal is. If we therein sometimes some faults commit, we may them not to their high majesties, but to ourselves impute whose passions plunge us each day in all afflictions, wherewith when we our souls do thorned feel, flattering ourselves, we see they destinies are, that gods would have it so, and that our care could not impeach, but that it must be so. Things here below are in the heavens begot, before they be in this our world born, and never can our weakness turn awry, the sailor's course of powerful destiny. Not here force, reason, human providence, holy devotion, noble blood prevails, and Jove himself, whose hand doth heavens rule, who both to gods and men as king commands, who on who earth are firm support with plenty stores, moves air and sea with twinkling of his eye, who all can do, yet never can undo, what once hath been by their hard laws decreed, when Trojan walls, great Neptune's workmanship, environed were with Greeks, and fortune's wheel, doubtful ten years now to the camp did turn, and now again towards the town returned. How many times did force and fury swell in Hector's veins, egging him to the spoil of conquered foes, which at his blows did fly as fearful sheep at feared wolves approach, to save in vain, for why it would not be? Poor walls of Troy from adversaries' rage, who dyed them in blood and cast to ground, heaped them with bloody burning carcasses. No, madam, think that if the ancient crown of your progenitors that Nihilus ruled, force take from you. The gods have willed it so. To whom oft times princes are odious. They have to everything an end ordained, or worldly greatness by them bounded is, some sooner, later, some as they think best. None their decree is able to infringe. But which is more to us disastrous men, which subject are in all things to their will? Their will is hid, nor while we live, we know how or how long we must in life remain. Yet must we not for that feed on despair and make us wretched ere we wretched be, but always hope the best, even to the last, that from ourselves the mischief may not grow. Then, madam, help yourself, leave of in time Antony's rack, lest it your rack procure. Retire you from him, save from wrathful rage of angry Caesar, both your realm and you. You see him lost, so as your amity unto his evils can yield no more relief. You see him ruined, so as your support no more henceforth can him with comfort raise. Withdraw you from the storm, persist not still to lose yourself. This royal diadem regain of Caesar. Sooner shining light shall leave the day and darkness leave the night. 
Soon a moist currents of tempestuous seas shall wave in heaven, and the nightly troops of stars shall shine within the foaming waves. Then I, thee, Antony, leave in deep distress. I am with thee, be it thy worthy soul lodge in thy breast, or from that lodging part, crossing the joyless lake to take her place in place prepared for men demigods. Live, if thee please, if life be loathsome, die, dead and alive, Antony, thou shalt see thy princess follow thee, follow and lament thy wreck, no less her own than was thy wheel. What helps his rack, this everlasting love? Help, or oh, help not, such must, such ought I prove. I'll done to lose yourself into no end. How ill think you to follow such a friend? But this, your love, naught mitigates his pain. Without this love, I should be inhumane. Inhumane? He, who his own death pursues. Not inhumane, who miseries is choose. Live for your sons. Nay, for their father die. Hard-hearted mother. Wife, kind-hearted I. Then will you them deprive of royal right? Do I deprive them? No, it's destiny's might. Do you not them deprive of heritage that give them up to adversary's hands, a man forsaken, fearing to forsake, whom such huge numbers held environed? To band them, one against whom the frowning world, banded with Caesar, makes conspiring war. The less ought I to leave him least of all. A friend in most distress should most assist, if that when Antony great and glorious his legions led to drink Euphrates streams, so many kings in train redoubted, redoubting him, in triumph raised as high as highest heaven, lord life disposing as him pleased best, the wealth of Greece, the wealth of Asia, in that fair fortune had I him exchanged for Caesar, then men would have counted me faithless, unconstant light. But now the storm and blustering tempest driving on his face ready to drown, alas, what would they say? What would himself in Pluto's mansion say? If I, whom always more than life he loved, if I, who am his heart, who was his hope, leave him, forsake him, and perhaps in vain, weakly, to please uh, who him hath overthrown, not light, unconstant, faithless should I be, but vile, forsworn, of treacherous cruelty. Cruelty to shun you, self-cruel are. Self-cruel him from cruelty to spare. Our first affection to ourself is due. He is myself. Next, it extends unto our children, friends, and to our country soil. And you, for some respect of wifely love, I'll be scarce wifely, lose your native land, your children, friends, and, which is more, your life with so strong charms doth love bewitch our wits. So fast in us does fire once kindled flames. Yet if his harm by yours redress might have. With mine it may be closed in darksome grave. And that. And I'm just going to pause you there. It seemed a shame in a way to stop you, but there is so much to have a look at in this scene. Wow. All of a sudden we've leapt into life. See, this is what happens when the women come on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the, the scene has shifted completely. We're in Cleopatra's private apartment, I assume, with her ladies, and um, they're telling it like it is, aren't they? I mean, there's none of this deference to, to, to the fact that she's a queen. Um, they're, they're telling her straight. And I do find it quite interesting that Antony literally had pages and pages where he got to bemoan his fate and wail his woes and you know Cleopatra gets you know a few lines uh, quite a few lines but you know a few lines and then all of a sudden she's told to shut up quite quickly by comparison <laughs> anyway what did we make of that wow. Helen what did you think well Nothing actually happens, does it? I mean, I know we've got dialogue, but we, but we don't have action. We so don't have. We're still we're still discussing the situation. 
We don't have um, physical action, that's true. Do we have yeah. emotional, an emotional journey? Well, uh, I was reading Eras and I didn't feel I was making any headway at all. <laughs> Interesting. Um, I mean, I was, I was putting it out there, but, and I was trying to put the other view, but she was listening, or if she was listening, she wasn't agreeing. So that tells us something about the difference between the character of uh, Eras and uh, Xiaomian, because Xiaomian gets her point across, I feel, um, a bit more forcefully. I saw other hands there. Who, who had their hand up? Alan. Yeah, I'm, I must admit, when, when we start getting dialogue, things do start to actually come alive, whereas I found the monologues earlier somewhat impenetrable. Um, and I think to follow up on Helen's point, um, while there's no change, Eris is not actually getting Cleopatra to change her mind, it is actually quite revealing of Cleopatra's character that there she is, there she stands, and it's going to take a force of nature to actually move her. Mm. Mm, you know, heels firmly dug in the sand. Yeah. She, I, think, I think the phrase force of nature is a good one to describe her. I actually wrote uh, in the margin here a couple of occasions, it's all gone a bit Wuthering Heights, mm. um, because she, she suddenly all went a bit Cathy, um, where she was talking about, you know, how she, you know, oh, I live if thee please, if life be loathsome, die. And then later on, um, she actually has a little, where does she, oh, there we go. She has a little interjection. Charmian says, our first affection is to ourself due. And she interjects, he is myself. And I almost expected her to say, I am Heathcliff. <laughs> I, I am Anthony. That's um, what it reminded me of. Ah, there we go. I so, was wondering about this because it's yeah. she has a really strong point of view and it's really clear. But at the same time, it's like this, this, this was familiar. This is yeah. odd. No, she is absolutely a force of nature. Um, but I would say Charmian is too. Eleanor, how did you find her? Boy, I did not expect such for me quite a strong feminist type character to be written in this point because up till then it has been just Cleopatra going yeah I think it's kind of been my fault that Anthony's like in the situation everyone's going yeah yeah pretty much and then Charmian is one of the characters that interposes that and goes hang on no 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 you've got to keep yourself you can't always blame you and it's really nice to see a character written with so strong a like feminist and female qualities of going don't blame yourself just because a man did some wrong stuff like yeah. it's just not you she's quite robust as well in the way she goes for it i mean no madam think i and mean her life as well like yeah. she goes yeah don't take your own life and if you think about serving characters they would never be or should not be seen as like written that way but the fact that she can say like yo queen don't take your own life in my own words then um that's a <laughs> that's a strong force to have in your court yeah absolutely Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Lois? Well, just that at the very end of this, the, uh, the lines that they speak are, uh, they're kind of interrupting each other. I mean, it's, mm. uh, it's quite different from most of the rest of it. They, the, the pace really picks up there, mm. just right at the end of what we read. It cracks along, doesn't it? And I do like those, I really like that bit in brackets um, in, um, in, in Charmian's last speech before we um, stopped. And you, for some respect of wifely love, all be s scarce wifely. It's like, is she throwing a bit of shade there? Is she actually yes. kind of getting in a bit of a dig? I, I, I think, I, I, yeah, but I, I don't know. You could play that either way, I suppose. Um, there's also quite a nice little um, back and forth about uh, free will, isn't there? Because I mean, you know, you've got the handmaiden saying, oh, um, well, you know, don't worry about it. I think this was this was Eris, wasn't it? Um, saying, you know, it's destiny. You couldn't help it. Um, and Cleopatra's not having any of it. She comes straight back and she's like, no, we're in charge of what we do. The gods don't care. And, it, and it's 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 quite a nice little early um, 
a summary of free will. Oh, lots of hands, Helen. Yeah, I think one of the questions that's being asked is, when is it legitimate to despair? Hmm. Yeah, D do they find any answers? Well, not so far, but we haven't finished the scene yet. <laughs> that's true, that's very, very true. Uh, who other hands do I see, Eric? I was going to say that it's quite interesting that, you know, you mentioned that part about destiny and then like later on when she's being like sort of grilled by Charmian, um, she does actually say it's destiny. OK, she contradicts herself. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's like, just shut up. I'm doing oh. this. I don't care what you say kind of thing. It's <laughs> um, a really nice sense, isn't there, of the like the fact that she's like losing the argument and so starts to um, you know, kind of backtrack on what she was saying. Oh, it's very kind of human touch. But that. also it's quite interesting that she's like, she's a queen, like queens can't fall in love. It's not like her thing. I mean, like if you think about it historically, a queen cannot, or like a king or, you know, a, a royal figure doesn't have that luxury. But here she has fallen in love and think terrible things have gone, you know, have happened. Mm. Indeed. Anybody else got anything to say about this scene, which really, yeah, very full of colour, full of life, cracked along. So let's pick it up. Cleopatra with mine, it may be closed in darksome grave, and Charmian has the next speech. And that, as an Alcester to herself unkind, you might exempt him from the laws of death. But he is sure to die, and now his sword, already moisted, is in his warm blood, helpless for any succour you can bring against death's sting, which he must shortly feel. Then let your love be like the love of old, when Carrion Queen did nourish in her heart of her mausolus, build for him a tomb whose stateliness a wonder new may make. Let him, let him have sumptuous funerals. Let grave thereon the horror of his fights. Let earth be buried with unburied heaps. Frame the farcely, the discoloured streams of deep Enipus. Frame the grassy plain which lodged his camp at siege of Mountaineer. Make all his combats and courageous acts and yearly plays to his praise institute. Honour his memory with doubled care. Breed and bring up the children of you both in Caesar's grace, who as a noble prince will leave them lords of this most glorious realm. What shame were that, oh gods, what infamy, with Antony in his good haps to share and overlive him dead, deeming enough to shed some tears upon a widow tomb? The afterlivers justly might report that I him only for his empire loved, and high estate and in that hard and that in hard estate I for another did him lewdly leave, like to those birds wafted with wandering wings from foreign lands in springtime he arrive and live with us so long as summer's heat and their food lasts, then seek another soil. And as we see with ceaseless fluttering, flocking of sealy flies, a brownish cloud to vintage wine, yet working in the tun, not parting thence while they sweet liquor taste, after, as smoke, all vanish in the air, and of the swarm not one so much appear. By this sharp death, what profit can you win? I neither gain nor profit seek therein. What praise shall you of after ages get? Nor praise nor glory in my cares are set. What other end ought you respect than this? My only end, my only duty is. Your duty must upon some good be founded. On virtue it, the only good is grounded. What is that virtue? That which us beseems. Outrage ourselves? Who that beseeming deems? Finish I will my sorrows dying thus. Minish you will your glories doing thus. Good friends, I pray you seek not to revoke my fixed intent of following Antony. I will die, I will die. Must not his life, my, his life and death by mine be followed? Meanwhile, dear sisters, live. And while you live, do often honour to our loved tombs, strew them with flowers, and sometimes haply the tender thought of Antony your lord, and 
Me, poor soul, to tears shall you invite, and our true loves your doleful voice commend. And think you, madam, we from you will part? Think you alone to feel death's ugly dart? Think you to leave us, and that the same sun shall see at once you dead, and us alive? We'll die with you, and Clotho pitiless shall us with you in a hellish boat embark. I live, I pray you, this disaster's woe which racks my heart alone to me belongs. My lot longs not to you, servants to be, no shame, no harm to you as is to me. Live, sisters, live, and seeing his suspect hath causeless me in sea of sorrows drowned, and that I cannot live, if so I would, nor yet would leave this life, if so I could, without his love, procure me Diomed, that gainst poor me he be no more incensed. Rest out of his conceit that harmful doubt that since his wreck he hath of me conceived, though wrong conceived witness you Reverend gods barking Anubis, Apis bellowing, tell him my soul burning impatient, forlorn with love of him, for certain seal of her true loyalty my corpse hath left, to increase of dead the number numberless. Go then, and if as yet he may bewail, if yet for me his heart one sigh forth brief, Blessed shall I be, and far with more content depart this world, where so I me torment. Mean season us, let this sad tomb enclose, attending here till death conclude our woes. I will obey your will. So the desert the gods repay of thy true faithful heart. And is not pity, gods, ah, gods of heaven, to see from love such hateful fruits to spring? And is not pity that this firebrand so lays waste the trophies of Philippi fields? Where are those sweet allurements, those sweet looks, which gods themselves right heart sick would have made? What doth that beauty, rarest gift of heaven, wonder of earth? Alas, what do those eyes? And that sweet voice all Asia understood, and sunburnt Afric wide in deserts spread. Is their force dead? Have they no further power? Cannot by them Octavius be surprised? Alas! If Jove, in midst of all his ire, with thunderbolt in hand some land to plague, had cast his eyes on my queen, out of hand his plaguing bolt had fallen out of his hand, fire of his wrath into vain smoke should turn, and other fire within his breast should burn. Naught lives so fair. Nature, by such a work, herself should seem in workmanship hath passed. She is all heavenly. Never any man but seeing her was ravished with her sight. The alabaster covering of her face, the coral color, her two lips and grains, her beamy eyes, two sons of this our world, of her fair hair, the fine and flaming gold, her brave straight stature, and her winning parts are nothing else but fires, fetters, darts. Yet this is nothing to the enchanting skills of her celestial spirit, her training speech, her grace, her majesty, and forcing voice, whither she it with fingers speech consort, or hearing sceptred king's ambassadors answer to each in his own language make. Yet now at need, it aids her not at all, with all these beauties, so her sorrow stings. Darkened with woe, her only study is to weep, to sigh, to seek for loneliness. Careless of all, her hair disordered hangs, her charming eyes whence murthering looks did fly, 
Now rivers grown whose wellspring anguishes do trickling wash the marble of her face. Her fair discovered breast with sobbing swollen, self cruel she still martyreth with blows. Alas, it's our ill hap, for if her tears she would convert into her loving charms to make a conquest of the conqueror, as well she might, would she her force employ, she should us safety from these ills procure, her crown to her and to her race assure. Unhappy he in whom self-succor lies, yet self-forsaken, wanting succor, dies. And exit Diomeda. Um, and I should have said earlier, um, but I didn't, but actually um, just before Diomeda started that big speech, everyone else exited too. Um, so that was a soliloquy from the handmaiden. And um, yeah, oh, that Cleopatra has let herself go. Hair all disordered hangs, you know, wash the marble of her face. It's it's all gone to pot. Uh, what do we? What did we think about that uh, second half of that? Really, quite um, again intense and um, fast moving scene. Yeah, well, Diomede is a man. I'm, uh, and, oh, uh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought oh, I thought that was a uh, okay by mistake. Diomede, yeah, he's a blue. Right. Yeah. Ah, okay. Right. Yeah. I just well, assumed sure. they were all handmaidens. Yeah. No, she's sending him, I think, as a messenger to Caesar, isn't she? Um, yes, she's definitely doing that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you no, know, the speech is rather curious because the first part is very lyrical all about how gorgeous and wonderful Cleopatra is. And then it suddenly changes. But now she looks a mess. And moreover, yeah. she's not yeah. going to be any use to us, is she? Because yeah. if, you know, if, she, if she would only uh, manage to seduce Caesar, then we might all get out of this situation. If she just put on a bit of charcoal, comb yeah. her hair, we're yeah. all fine. Um, actually, I, while we're on the subject of looks, I just wanted to flag up um, for future reference. I'm sure Rob has probably already done this, but um, the alabaster covering of her face. And we had another reference to her being um, alabaster earlier in this scene. So we've got literal whitewashing going on there. Um, so that's maybe something that if you were going to stage this, uh, you maybe want to have a look at. Thoughts from the room? Uh, not necessarily about whitewashing, but about anything in general. Helen. Yeah, um, I think that we do get a picture of a ruler as well as a woman here. Mm. That that it's um, her grace, her majesty, and then she 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 was good at languages and dealing with ambassadors. Mm. Um, so she wasn't just a. Um, uh very beautiful she was she was she was a queen mm. she had statescraft mm. yeah i think so um and this was and he, he he's also saying as well she might would she her force employ she should us safely from these ills procure and i don't think that is just combing her hair i think it's putting her mind to it yes yes Yes, to be fair, um, I was playing that up for comedy value, but there is the sense there that it, it's a sense of frustration, isn't there? Because you have here someone who is so talented uh, and good at what she does, but she won't help, her, help herself and therefore she's not helping her people either. Yeah, but this is a French play. Therefore, being a tragedy, there is absolutely zero comic relief. Mm. Yeah. Um, Lois, did I see a hand earlier? Oh. Well, yes, I was going to say that, uh, I mean, it's, this was true of Cleopatra. She did know lots of languages and so on. It was also true of Queen Elizabeth, of course, and uh, this might be relevant here. Indeed, yeah. Um, and what about earlier in the scene? We, we had the second half of her interchange with um, with Charmion, and then um, we had Eris again. Um, struck me there was a nice bit of emotional blackmail um, going on earlier there. It's like, oh, well, if you insist on doing this and dying, we're going to die with you. 
um, which I, I, I thought was quite an, uh, a neat bit of psychology on uh, Xiaomian's part, but it did backfire um, because it then made her think, oh yes, you carry on after I'm gone. Oh, and what will Anthony think of me? I need to know what Anthony thinks of me before I die. Um, but what did we think of Charmian's tactics there? Um, question, wouldn't it have been expected of them to die with her? I, I, pro I mean, I, my, my knowledge of ancient Egypt uh, is, is based on several really bad Hollywood films. So um, I, I would say maybe yes, um, but I, I honestly don't know. Um, but it's, it's more the fact that she's, she's making a point of it, isn't she? She's underlining it. Like if you, if you die, we die. So, you know, just think on that, madam. Yeah. Um, anybody else? And there was quite a nice thing I thought earlier at the beginning when it's like, oh, can't you just build him a tomb? <laughs> and just build him a really nice tomb. Yeah. Uh, she's she's quite um having said there's no um you know comic relief in this play there isn't but but Charmian does have a sort of earthy uh quality to her doesn't she yeah yeah also this play is pre Corneille and Racine I mean it's uh, it's the kind of thing they were sort of reacting against uh uh they, they made drama more classical in fact and apparently there was a rival tradition based on uh, mainly uh, Italian, the Commedia Italienne, which uh, was tragic comedy and which, uh, which did have uh, uh, comic elements in it and even comic characters. Mm. I think probably derived from Spain originally. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, right, okay. So does anyone else have anything to say about this? Yes, Eric. I didn't really have very much, but I mean, like, you know, I'm just going to start going and, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, no, it's just like, I think it's interesting how, you know, Charmian makes this intervention, then, you know, Eris is sort of tries to jump on the bandwagon along with Charmian. And then Diomede comes up and it's like, okay, so what do you want me to do? And so like, it's sort of a focus change from like, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And then like, oh, okay. Yeah. And the practical sort of managing side of things, uh, telling people what to do. And mm. then like back to, I'm, I'm assuming it was, it goes back to Cleopatra later, but I don't know. It's just sort of, it's interesting that they, ex they all expect her to be like sort of this queenly figure who should just shut up and be a woman, so to speak, it, 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 as in, in the play. Um, but like, you know, shut up and do like what you know how to do, like use yes. your loving wiles and all that stuff, loving, lovely charms or whatever the line was. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like she, she, she has a role to play and uh, there's, there's quite a lot of resentment there, isn't there, that she doesn't want to play it, which... Uh, Oh, is it justified or not? I don't know. You can leave that. Uh, I'll leave that question for you to all answer privately. Alan. Yeah, I was just thinking, going back to the confusion we had when at the beginning of this chat there about um, Darmody, um, who is listed as being the secretary to Cleopatra. Mm. Um, I think it does make sense to have that as a male voice um, following on from the sort of a three-way conversation with the ladies um, in terms of giving the thing a bit more depth and, uh, and character um, and a bit more variety into it. Well, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you have this section between the women where it, it absolutely zings mm. and, and there's quite a lot of like, back and forth between them and, and uh, a lot of energy in uh, the arguments and the counter arguments. And then like they all leave the room. Uh, and then if, 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 if he is a he, then, it, then, he, then he takes it, yeah, he take the ch energy changes completely and he takes it and he makes it more introspective, which of course is what we had right at the beginning of the play. So there's a sort of um, shape to that there most definitely. Anyone got anything else to say? Any brilliant insights to add, Lois? I suppose the only other thing is that if he's a male, uh, there's also the probability that he's in love with her himself since he said that everybody <gasps> is. Mm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. 
that's true. So yeah, maybe he's personally pained about the fact that she's not doing her hair. It's like, oh, she's <laughs> normally so pretty. <laughs> Eric. I was just gonna say, so in that sense, could we, like, since she's reacting to like what is expected and stuff, could we say that she's a feminist figure compared to Charmian or are we going to like not argue that out later? I, I don't know. I, I, I think there is scope for discussing that, but I, 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 I suspect that would be um, better done within the rehearsal room in a, pro in a particular production. Um, ah, it's a it's a it's a valid point, but um, I think it's one to explore when you're getting into the text up at a deeper level with your with your cast. Right. Well, um, we are now entering the final section. Uh, Diomeda has left, and we are back with the chorus. Chorus number three, please. Oh, sweet fertile land wherein Phoebus did with breath inspire, man whom men did first begin, formed first of Nile's mire. Whence of arts the eldest kinds, earth's most heavenly ornament, were as from their fountain sent to enlighten our misty minds whose gross sprite from endless time, as in darkened prison pent, never did to knowledge climb. Where the Nile, our father good, father like doth never miss, yearly to us, us to bring such food as to life required is, visiting each year this plain and with fat slime covering it, which his seven mouths do spit as the season comes again, making thereby greatest grow, busy reaper's joyful pain, when his floods do highest flow. Wandering prince of rivers, thou, honour of the Ethiop's land, of a lord and master now, thou a slave in all must stand. Now of Tiber, which is spread less in force and less in fame, reverence thou must the name whom all other rivers dread for his children swollen in pride who by conquest seek to tread round this earth on every side now thou must begin to send tribute to thy watery shore as sea paths thy steps shall bend yearly presents more and more Thy fat scum are fruitful corn, piled from hence with thievish hands. All unclothed shall leave our lands into foreign country born, which puffed up with such a prey shall thereby the praise adorn of that sceptre Rome doth sway. Not thee helps thy haunts to hide, far from hence in unknown grounds. Yet thy waters wander wide, yearly breaking banks and bounds, and that thy sky-coloured brooks, through, though a, through a hundred people pass, drawing plots for trees and grass, and a thousand turns and crooks, whom all weary of their way, thy throats which in wideness pass, power into their mother sea. Nought so happy, hapless life in this world as freedom finds, nought wherein more sparks are rife to inflame courageous minds. But if force must us enforce, needs a yoke to undergo, under foreign yoke to go. Still, it proves a bondage worse and doubled subjection. See, we shall and feel and know, subject to a stranger groan. From henceforth, forward, from henceforward for a king, whose first being from this place should his breast by nature bring, care of country to embrace, we at surly face must quake, 
of some Roman madly bent, who our terror to augment his proconsul's axe will shake. Driving with our kings from hence, our established government, justice, sword, and law's defense. Nothing worldly of such might, but more mighty destiny, by swift time's unbridled flight, makes in end his end to see. Everything time overthrows, naught to end does steadfast stay. His great scythe mows all, mows, mows all away as the stalk of tender rose. Only immortality of the heavens doth it oppose against his powerful deity. One day there will come a day which shall quail thy fortune's flower, and thee ruined low shall lay in some barbarous prince's power, when the pity wanting fire shall, O Rome, thy beauties burn, and to humble ashes turn thy proud wealth and rich attire. Those gilt roofs which turret wise, justly making envy mourn, threaten now to pierce the skies. As thy forces fill each land, harvest making here and there, reaping all with ravening hand, they find growing anywhere. From each land, so they thy full multitudes repair shall make, from the common spoil to take what to each man's share may fall. Fingered all thou shalt behold, no iota left for token's sake, that thou wert so great of old. Like unto the ancient Troy, whence derived thy founders be, conquering foe shall thee enjoy, and a burning prey in thee. For within this turning ball, this we see and see each day, all things fixed ends do stay, ends to first beginnings fall, that naught, how strong or strange, changeless, changeless doth endure all way, but endureth fatal change. And the chorus wraps up the end of act two with a sort of more melancholy and uh, more accepting or just more acknowledging um, the situation. Um, and then a nice bit of schadenfreude at the end there. You'll get yours, Rome. You'll see. You'll just, you, yeah, you just wait. Uh, thoughts about that final scene that we're doing today? Alan. Uh, I must, must admit, one thing that struck me when we looked through it is that the original translator obviously took a lot of care within the chorus sections to actually get a rhyme scheme in there which from the sounds of what Dan was saying is reasonably close to the original feel of it, but didn't seem to take the same approach with the longer monologues. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why those can sometimes seem to drag a bit. Well, I mean, also, although Rob uh, uh, said not to mention this, I mean, also they are very long and it, it doesn't really, matter to a degree how whether they rhyme or not I don't, I don't think but presumably she uh, she did that for a reason presumably it wasn't just because she couldn't be bothered um you know but perhaps she wanted to not uh, rhyme I mean we can't possibly know what what was going on in Mary um Sydney's head but I yeah I, I do think um this seems to me to have a lot of care um there's some beautiful language which I know is probably translated from Garnier, but it's just, uh, it seems to me that, you know, she, she's taken an awful lot of care with this to make something very, very beautiful, to turn something very um, painful that could be very miserable into something very beautiful. Lois. Yeah, I think she really loved verse form. I mean, when she and her brother, Philip, translated the Psalms, mm -hmm. uh, 
people have pointed out that she used a lot greater variety of verse forms, in fact, than he did. She kept experimenting with different ways of, uh, of putting the Psalms into English verse. Mm. Yes, and uh, we've certainly got a lot of verse forms here. Anyone got anything else to say about that final scene? No? Then we will go into general thoughts about the end, about that uh, first two acts of the play. How are we finding it so far? I shall go around the room unless anybody wants to start. No, right, in which case I shall pick on you, Helen. Oh God, I'm so depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Is that anything to do with the play, though, to be fair? <laughs> well, the play hasn't helped. I mean, I mean, these... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, Cleopatra is filled with grief. And grief means that you lose power to change things. Um, in, what, in what sense? Well she can't do what she could do to make things better for her country, for her children, because of her grief and because of her fear of being less than worthy of Antony. Mm, she's kind of immobilized, isn't she, by what yeah. he thinks of yeah. her. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and people, what, fundamentally what the message is that people are giving her is, you could actually be quite useful at this point to mm. your children, to your country. Mm. Mm. And she is saying, yes, but if I don't obsess about the death of Antony and my possible guilt for it, what will history and Antony say of me? Yeah, she's sort of a bit of a, a, a victim to her own... Um... You can imagine if this was a uh, modern day, she'd be like fretting constantly about how many like followers she had on Instagram or whatever. There's a, there is that sense that she's she's, well, she's a bit too yes. worried about her reputation. She's she. I mean, I, I think her her emotion is genuine. I'm not saying she's putting it on for effect. Um, I don't think Instagrammers are either. I think they take it quite seriously. Well, I wouldn't know. Eric. I was going to say that, like, yeah, she's sort of, like, worried about posterity and history and stuff and her reputation. But then again, if she were a male character, uh, as we saw last week, like, it would be considered almost normal, um, sort of, like, um, worrying about what other people will think of you as a monarch and that kind of thing. Mm. So, yeah. How posterity will judge you. Yes, that's true. Mm. Have you got any other thoughts, Eric, about this? Well, it's very, I don't know, it's very beautifully written, but um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, as Dan said, like the rhyme in, in French is way better. Uh, but I mean, just like the flowery language is sort of like, sort of very, I don't know, I, I guess it's like the beginning of a shift from um, like specific, you know, formulaic things, and they just sort of moved into like sort of lyrical language which is very beautiful but also not very useful when you're talking well beautiful but packs a punch i think it's it's not really i mean clearly we've we've seen from the dialogue interchanges that you know the writer can do that um but that's perhaps not what the intent is in in these larger speeches it's more about um psychodrama and the uh, making taking a philosophy and making it human perhaps i don't know we'll see dan have you got any final thoughts i don't think i do other than what i, I said earlier mm -hmm. uh, i think it's more of a matter of I, for me i think it's a matter of preference i find her, I find her language she uses quite lovely and i like listening to um, her translation of it um yeah, I mean, of course, if you hear the French one as well, I mean, yes, it's very enchanting to hear that, but I don't think it's really, I mean, I understand why one would want to compare it, I mean, obviously, but I don't think that she does a poor job at it. And I, mm. I, I do think that there are ways of reading this um, there, that that do serve it much, that serve it much better than possibly what we might be used to um, during these readings. Mm, it's a play that would um, 
really benefit from a bit of preparation and rehearsal, I, I, I think. Uh, well, even you shift the mindsets as well about mm. what it should be, what it should be like, what, how it should be structured. I think it is actually quite well structured. I mean, like I said, I've, I've mentioned already with the mise en page, with the way it's formatted, with the way it's invented, the clues are all there on how it can be read. But I think it just goes against the nature of how, I guess, typically either we've been trained to read or how we want to read the text. Well, perhaps how a modern ear uh, hears it as well, or, or rather a modern tongue speaks it. Lois, final thoughts? Yeah, um, I think the way to do this is to get somebody to write a complete score for it. I mean, the, the people that uh, invented Italian opera thought they were reviving Greek tragedy, and I think she may have been thinking something of the sort. I mean, it's, uh, it's very musical, the, uh, very lyrical, nothing happens, it's ideal for people just standing there and singing, really. Hmm. Interesting perspective, the tragedy of Antony the Musical. Yes. Uh, Eleanor. You? There we go. Um, you go into this knowing it's tragedy. I mean, tragedy of Mark Antony. Oh boy, oh boy, it does not disappoint. It <laughs> yes. is, it is a, uh, it is a very, very sad, as Helen said, depressing piece of work, but also very beautiful in the way that it is compared to other Greek tragedies. This does remind me of like going on from Greek tragedies with all of these monologues going on. There is almost this like depressive piece but like with a sense of like lovely positive flowery lyrical language which would as I'm like Lois and we've all been talking about would be lovely to put to some music in terms mm. of the chorus so yeah this has been very in a weird way nicely depressive nicely depressive yeah good <laughs> not an oxymoron at all yeah. Alan any uh last thoughts from you yeah I'm I must admit I the only bits I knew of this before was the chorus ones, because when Rob was doing the original exploring sessions for the you know, lead up to his audio production, he had me read all of the choruses, but without the intervening material. So I'd actually heard that or read that before. Um, and that was part of what was confusing me because I knew that there was a rhythm to it that worked, whereas I didn't find that with the the monologues. And as I commented earlier, I think the, the point at which you've got Cleo and her two handmaidens, actually, and you've got some debate going on, and I think we've got a similar sequence turning up tomorrow, um, where it starts getting into dialogue it does liven up very considerably. Mm, I, I wonder actually if um, if you like if you were doing um, Cleopatra's greatest hits, you could actually take out that scene um, between her and her handmaidens, and actually that could actually be a standalone little yeah. um, scenette, couldn't it? Because it is it, very strong. Yeah, it it, it, it would work as a, a piece for a drama festival or something as a. Mm. Um, you know, a three-hander, um, you know, that could actually stand on its own. Yeah, interesting point. Tamara, you played Cleopatra, so what are your final thoughts on this? <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Um, it was funny when we, because we kept talking about, this is wonderfully depressing and what a great day to do it. <laughs> uh, but I kept thinking of the plays that we've read that had that random B plot with the clown mm. and, and, and how today I genuinely missed that. <laughs> like there were times when I just really, really wanted to be, and now we go to the peasants and the random clown that is doing the random things that have nothing to do with Cleo <laughs> or Anthony. Um, so so it's, it's really, really interesting to see why potentially when we talk about, oh, do we think the clown was added later? Um, why that would be the case. Like this, this play, I think, is a really strong argument for why you might want to add a clown. Yeah, it's that's a really interesting point. Like, yes, sometimes that light relief is uh, is perhaps not so jarring and can be quite a good thing. Yeah. 
Good. Anyone? Oh, Eric, I see a hand. Yeah, but like the thing is, for example, in Greek tragedy, like, you know, classical Greek, or, you know, uh, no, Oedipus, all that stuff, it's like meant to be like that so that you can kind of like just hit the, the spectator with like all that emotion and then they just go, whoa, what just happened? <laughs> like, how did we get here? Uh, without like having the sort of, you know, that sort of overwhelming feeling and then the sort of you know, whatever. I mean, catharsis, all that theory and so on. But I mean, mm. you know. Yeah. I mean, it's. True. I mean, we're we're only two acts into this, and I, I haven't actually read the rest of the play yet. So I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the in the second half as well? Um, yeah, Helen. Yeah, I mean, the Greek plays that, as I understand it, the day of tragedy was ended with a satyr play. You know, phalluses and fart jokes. Yes. Of so, do you think we're going to get that at the end of this? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, we will find out tomorrow. Lois. Yeah. I mean, some of the Greek tragedies do have happy endings. And Aristotle actually said that audiences preferred those. You can see why. Uh, and uh, some of them, I think, especially Euripides, do have moments that are sort of comic or characters that are much more down to earth. I think it's, uh, is it Electra's husband in uh, uh, the uh, Iphigenia in, in Trachis, I think, who was a really nice guy and uh, uh, just totally unlike. Oh, he, yeah, he's been married to Iphigenia. That's right. And uh, is uh, I think that's it, or is it Electra? Anyway, the, uh, he's he's very nice to her, and he's but he realizes that he's only a peasant, and that their idea of marrying her to him was to humiliate her, and he's trying to be nice about it. And anyway, it's a completely different world from uh, these sort of high tragedy world. So there's, there seems to be a tendency almost everywhere for people not to be able to sustain the tragic mood, perhaps, or, you know, to want something that's a bit more like reality. Mm, to sort of, yeah, yeah, this, uh, mix a bit of light into the dark. Talking of which, I see a Robert has joined us to illuminate us with his presence. So I am going to hand over to him. Thank you very much, everyone, for helping me out. Well, I was just going to say, Sarah, do you have any final thoughts yourself? I weirdly like this. I, <laughs> maybe it's because I'm feeling quite nihilistic today. I don't know. Um, I, I I like the psychodrama, and I I think there's a lot of scope in this for um, actually really attacking all that misery and turning it into something very dramatic and very compelling, as something that could actually have an audience rooted to their seats they might want to slip their wrists when they leave the auditorium, but they will have definitely, you'll have definitely made an impression on them. So <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what that says about me, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm quite liking it. Yeah, I, I, what I really love about this play is its potential in performance. It looks mm. really unsatisfying on the page. Uh, and I said at the beginning, don't keep going on about, you know, there's a long speech, then a long speech and a long speech, but actually it, in a sense, it doesn't have a long speech followed by a long speech followed by a long speech. It's got a long prologue by Antony, and then it has uh, three units to one scene. And in the scripts that everyone's got there, uh, they've been turned into one scene. Uh, and that's sort of my thinking on this, is you've got a chorus coming on saying, our lives are terrible. And then, essentially, a, 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 the philosopher comes in and goes, we're surrounded, people. Um... <laughs> <laughs> we're doomed and then they go into the doom and that's when they go really into the doom they go from life is terrible um and building the the world that anthony has dragged in with him uh you know they're surrounded they are they they've they've got an army on their heels and are the people going to survive and the the people are a really important character in this play yeah. um and then we go from that scene and i i i i know the original authors don't uh, broke that into different units of action but as far as i'm concerned you have chorus action someone bursting on and talking to the chorus and then the chorus react. So it's not necessarily speech, speech, speech. What it is, is essentially a series of very long dialogue interaction. Um, and in working towards an audio version, we worked very hard on actually having the chorus being multiple voices. I have no idea if this is going to work in the edit. I may re-record all of it. Um, the other thing to say about any play with long speeches is a great thing. We have blue pencils. They were invented um, by God to uh, to <laughs> cut things down. So if there's too much material, that's fine. It's better than having too little. Um, talking about the idea of uh, uh, doing standalone scenes, uh, we 
did I did some time in the past I'm not going to put a number on it um uh, a cut down version of uh, the tragedy of Anthony uh, which focused primarily on the scenes uh, with uh, Anthony and uh, uh, and and uh, Cleopatra, um, uh, less of the chorus material. Uh, we put in a narrator to just briefly move it along, and that gets it down very nicely to about 40, 45 minutes. There is a recording of that, which is soup uh, and unlistenable, which is such a shame because uh, uh, it, it it is very doable. So there's lots of roots into this. I mean, I, I really like Dan's point, actually, that there is also quite a... A, a different presentational approach. I mean, my mind is always to how do you make it more dynamic and more exciting, but actually maybe a way is to just not fight it and treat it as a as a text. Um, and yet the, it's a matter really of just making sure you've got the right audience coming to see the show and making sure they're not coming expecting any, any humour at all. Um, and, um, you know, it's not a desperately long play. We spent quite a long time today. Um, Sarah has brilliantly chaired. I was very impressed with all of your work today it was lovely uh it was terribly frustrating for me not being involved it was awful sarah was horribly distracted by my backseat driving it was it was awful um but um yeah it's it's actually not a desperately long amount of uh text we've done today tomorrow we've got a lot to pack in so sarah's going to be very very hard on you to keep driving the pace to uh, get through three three whole acts tomorrow um i'll bring the whip yeah, so thank you very it, much, everybody, it. for a wonderful session. It's been great listening to uh, what all you've uh, done, and uh, hopefully we'll get more tomorrow. Thanks very much to Sarah for chairing today, being guest host, and uh, thank you all, uh, all the readers, for all their work, and goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.